Hello, today is uh, Wednesday, uh, January 26th, and today we're, we're going through our second reading for this coming Sunday, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. Our second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this text, as we have been marching through 1 Corinthians, or the heart, rather, of 1 Corinthians, um, this is the text that I think gets read most often. That is the, uh, the text that is the lodestar, um, especially for weddings. This is a, this is a love text, right? It's, uh, when you are planning your wedding, you want the theme, uh, of if you are having, if, if you're having scripture read, you want the theme to be on love, um, uh, and this is the text. Love is patient. Love is kind. Da 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 da. Right? We love love, and so we're gonna read this text all the time. And I just want to <laughs> maybe caution, or maybe just share with you the uh, <laughs> the commentary from a colleague of mine, a retired colleague, as we were going through this this week um, in our. Uh, pericope study, our pastor's Bible study. Um, as we were looking at this, he took issue with this text being used for weddings or being uh, so heavily used. And his issue with that, of course, was that the word that Paul is using for love really has very little to do with romantic love. Um, we have that, we have this Beautiful love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. That that lovely sentiment about what love looks like um, is uh, in some ways romanticized uh, in our when we in our wedding in our wedding texts in our wedding sermons, and it doesn't get at the root of what this text is is telling us what Paul is trying to communicate because there is a there is a word and Paul is writing in Greek he's writing in koine common basically Greek um, there's a word for romantic love it's eros eros is another name for cupid it's the little baby with wings who fires love arrows that's that's the greek concept of romantic love that uh, passion uh, the attraction to another person that someone might feel. But if that's what you're thinking about when you're reading this, then we really are missing the mark. Uh, Greek, uh, unfortunately for English, we have um, this one word, love, that gets used for uh, probably 30 different emotions, right? We, I love ice cream, but I also love my wife, but I also... Uh, love to uh, sit outside in the sun. You know, there are different, you know, I love, I can say I love 
uh, one could say they love their country, but uh, it's not, it's a different kind of love, of course, than the love that you have for your uh, pet or the love that you have for your spouse or your child. It And English is sloppy that way because we have one word that gets used exclusively. In the Greek here, Paul is not using eros. He's not using romantic love. He's using the word agape. And that word agape has a different connotation. Um, in fact, it's a word that was initially used in the Greek context for the sort of um, patronizing love that a master has towards a servant. That uh, there is an understanding of um, the servant is uh, not only uh, a, not only is a servant, but is childlike. And so the master uh, has this sort of, they're, they're, the love between them is an unequal love. It's a love that is looking up and a love that could be looking down. But Paul here uses agape. He uses that term for love, this term that was originally kind of used in um, unequal relationships um, and is usually understood from the point of view of the person who's on top. Paul flips it around and here Paul is saying, we are, as Christians need to claim this kind of love. We need to claim this kind of love and think of ourselves not as the master looking down, but as the servant looking up. Um, and so when Paul gets into uh, the re, uh, the <laughs> why we need love, why the community needs love, he's talking to a community that is having that is deeply divided, uh, a community that has uh, these deep arguments, uh, these rifts that have grown up over who has um, more spiritual authority or who uh, deserves a better seat at the table. And so Paul is saying, you are missing the mark. You are missing entirely what kind of community that we're building. And so when when Paul is talking about agape, this, this love, he's not talking about the love one individual might have for another. He's talking instead about the loving posture of an entire community. And so when we're reading this, we have those connotations of marriage or uh, or the love, the great loves we maybe have felt in our lives. But this is a kind of love that is not about passion, that isn't really about high emotion. Instead, this is a love that is about commitment. It's a love that is about self-sacrifice. Uh, it's about self-negation, really. A love that puts others fully in front of of the self. It's a love that is uh, in emulation of Jesus and who Jesus is. It's a love that leads, in some sense, finally to the cross. And so this love that totally puts the other ahead of the self is what animates the community. You can have the gifts of tongues and you can have prophetic powers and you can have faith, but without love at the center, without love animating it, it is just clanging symbols or nothing at all. Nothing is gained if that animating spirit of self-sacrificial, uh, self-negating love is not there, then you have nothing. And so Paul is, is putting that forward. He's giving a challenge here to the to a church that has not loved each other. He is saying, if you're going to do anything, if you're going to stay in this community, if you want this community to succeed, you have to start from a standpoint of self-sacrificial love that puts others first entirely. And so that's, uh, that's our text. I kind of disagree with my colleague. I think it can be read for a marriage, but then it sort of puts different connotations on what kind of sermon we're going to be preaching. It 
puts different connotations um, on what kind of marriage we're talking about. One that is not entirely based on uh, passion or entirely based on uh, pure attraction, but is based on something really deep, uh, a foundation that is perhaps uh, perhaps more stable uh, and perhaps in the end uh, more fulfilling. But that's our text for this for this second reading, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, I hope you're staying warm. I hope you're staying healthy. Bye-bye.